So here is image of Holcomb, um, named for his boyhood home. And uh, so he started doing this here and there with the images of his mother. He also, where he would kind of refer to the old country. And then we have here a work in the 30s and a couple different versions of Korkum. And then this develops later in the 1940s. And I'll talk about Garden in Sochi in just a little bit. Um, there is an increased, uh, there is an increased and more visible splicing of past and present, present in the 1940s work. And part of this is due to time spent outside of New York City, in Virginia and Connecticut, being back out in the landscape, as many as have noted. But it can also be directly related to the permanence of the situation in America. It was during this era that Gorky married and began having a family. And I talked with Gorky's widow about this, that you know, he just, even though she often feel, felt guilty that, that they were taking him away from his painting, and at the same time, just having those children was just this huge joy. It, so there's, again, this kind of strange, con this difficult conflict with him. And it was during this era in the 1940s that he married and began having a family. Indeed, it's well documented that the need to form families was, just as was succeeding at a chosen profession, extremely important to survivors of trauma because it served as physical evidence, not only to others but to the survivors themselves, as an appearance of having overcome the past. This enhanced attachment to the past works conversely as a response to Gorky's physical estrangement from the old country. Significantly, too, Gorky began to look at the landscape or scenes around him for inspiration. Gorky's work also became more abstract as he engaged in numerous drawings that recreated and heightened the essence of an arrangement in front of him, um, such as depicted in the drawing Virginia landscape. And this is one of many, many drawings of the Virginia landscape that he did throughout uh, numerous periods of times and, and, and visits in the 1940s um, to, to the, his in-laws farm in Virginia. And this was completed in 1944. At the time, Gorky's wife Agnes and he were spending time in the country in Virginia and Connecticut. Gorky used the landscape as a point of departure through which he accessed images or idealizations of his his childhood home. So, so something was a memory trigger often in these cases. Just as Gorky trotted out ethnic dances at New York parties, he mined his memory for old country experiences in a way that often combined the past and present in abstract terms. For instance, the 1944 How My Mother's Embroidered Apron unfolds in my life is an abstraction based on a memory of how when he was a boy his mother would hold his face close to her apron body and tell him folk tales. Gorky remembered that her stories and the images, her stories and the embroidery on her apron got confused in my mind and with my eyes closed all of my life her stories and her embroidery kept unraveling pictures in my memory. So he was my, he was, he was melding also the identifiable and the abstract. So you can see here these washes of paint, but just a little bit you can see in the center a standing figure and a figure of what appears to be a young man who has his face pressed up against her apron. Uh, but again, they're washed over and they're kind of uh, mixed in with the color and the, uh, the dribble of the paint. Interestingly, it was when Gorky's life in America became permanent after he became a citizen in the late 30s, married and started having children, and became more closely associated with the Surrealists. Now, the Surrealists were European artists who created art that embraced the dream world and free association of Sigmund Freud in psychoanalysis. And you see them, him there with the, the kind of leader of the Surrealists, Andre Bataan. Um, it was about this time that he began also to draw, draw strongly from his pre-genocide Armenian memories. And it was at that time, too, or concurrently during the 1940s, during this engagement with the Surrealists, that his work became more abstract. As the renowned literary critic and exile Edward Said explains, Exiles regard experiences as if they are about to disappear. What is it that anchors them in reality? What would you save of them? What would you give up? Only someone who has achieved independence and detachment 
Someone whose homeland is sweet, but whose circumstances make it, makes it impossible to recapture that sweetness, can answer those questions. Gorky could never return uh, to his homeland, like all Armenians um, who were subjected to the genocide. I mean, essentially the homeland was gone. And displacement and extraction works in this way for Gorky. And I'm going to explain this in a little bit more detail. Although the initial inspiration for many of Gorky's late works was the American landscape, so he would be sitting in front of, uh, in, uh, on the Virginia farm looking at the fields, its subject was often the childhood memories or places such as the Garden of Horkum. The mutable quality of Gorky's work is evident in the Garden and Sochi series. Um, Gorky used the land, American landscape as his inspiration, wedded it with his childhood memories, and worked through several versions that became more and more abstract. The memories had no real context, like Gorky had no fixed identity, and, had to cre and he had to create one through renaming, and that's kind of what he's doing here. So in keeping with his Russian pseudonym, Gorky gave Horkum the Russian pseudonym name of Sochi, a Black Sea resort, thus reinforcing the mutable quality of the proper name and its connection to the mutable quality of landscape in, in his art. And when you think of landscape, it's mutable. It changes with the seasons. Like the unfolding apron, Gorky's works from the series Garden and Sochi are examples of this reference to the sweet past. Again, on the left is the 1941 version, and on the right is the 1943 version. Both may refer to a moment when Gorky's father left the family to go to America, giving his son a gift of traditional Middle Eastern slippers as a resemblance. There we are, which I pulled off the web there. Um, or, uh, as he told to his wife, it was the shape of the Armenian goatskin butter churn from the old country, which you see sort of here. They kind of shook the goat skin to, uh, to make the butter. But it also becomes uh, somewhat distorted because, distorted because like in a dream, memory becomes distorted and, they can, and it can also trigger things in the present, such as uh, the Virginia landscape reminded him of home, or in this case, you might have seen this work on the left, which is by Juan Miro, uh, which is still life with old shoe, and that's another possible, uh, another possible uh, source for his work. Margaret Bedrosian, author of The Magical Pine Ring, a study of Armenian-American immigrant literature, comments on the effect comments on the effect of uh, the transplantation on the Armenian memory. The most significant features of this life lie beyond objective documentation. Only fleeting snatches of memory and the springs of dreams and nightmare can point toward what no longer exists. Elusive as the taste of pure water or the scent of ripe, ripe apricots on a summer breeze, the memories of the Armenian immigrant nevertheless shaped his interior life concerns with the power of myth that replaces actuality after uprooting. Such a comment about dream and myth can literally be applied to Gorky's work, Scent of Apricots on the Field from 1944, which is an atmospheric abstraction that refers to the essence of apricots. Ripe apricots from Turkey or Armenia, rather than from California, are ones, uh, the, California's apricots are all the ones that I buy here, are pretty tasteless. Um, but the ones that you find in Turkey or Armenia are literally orgasmic in their honey-like sweetness. They're amazing. <laughs> Along with their scent, I mean, you can just smell their scent. And this is what Gorky remembers in this work, literally. This is literally the sweetness of what Saeed speaks. And also, I should note, this is probably my favorite Gorky work, and it's on the cover of my book. I was the, the collector, who's, who's, who is still unknown to me, actually graciously agreed to allow me to put that on the cover of my book. Um, 